Look up. Look up. Look up from your phone. Your eyes are burning. Your heart is churning. Look up to live. Look down to flounder. Stop giving in to all the demand. You're better than this. Remove your hand. Look up to live. Look down to flounder. You're living inside the machine. A terrible example for children to be seen. Look up to live. Look down to flounder. Have a look at your little finger. It's all misshapen to support that spinner. Look up to live. Look down to flounder. Your eyes are worth a billion each. The adverts that you eat, sending techies to the beach. Look up to live. Look down to flounder. The bird song is unheard. The sunset is missed. Your attention is unbroken, and your mind is pissed. Look up to live. Look down to flounder. Look up. Look up. Look up from your phone. Hello, my name is Michael Don Smith, and my name is Michael De Groot, and together we are bringing you the story of a speech podcast. Wow, very nice, Michael. And so let's all keep looking up and listen up. How do you listen up? Do you turn your head to one side? Cock the head? On, oh no, try that. Yeah. So really great. Great to be. Back on the Sora Speech channel, um, the last couple of sessions we've had two of our five greatest speeches, which I hope you all enjoyed and loved and learned a lot from. If you didn't hear them, they were, in fact, the tremendous Tom Cruise and the much more tremendous Jack Nicholson, my absolute favorite all-time movie actor at this moment anyway. A bit changes. I'm sure it is for you as well, for all of us. So what we want to do is step away from that theme this episode and talk about some of the great stories and speeches, I suppose, that have been going on in our lives, myself and the other Michael. So the reason I say that is I've been learning so much. You know, uh, the more I'm in this space, the storytelling space, the speech-making space, the talking and presenting stuff, it just gets more and more, it's more, and more exciting. So I mm. came across a lady called Vanessa Van Andrews, Van Edwards. Edwards, yeah. Van Edwards, thank you, Marco. And she's awesome. It's a new book. 10 months old, I think, not much more. It's new to me anyway. It's called Captivate. And certainly Google it, Vanessa Van Andrews and... Edwards. <laughs> Vanessa Van Edwards and <laughs> Captivate. I'm so excited. So, yeah, so I learned a lot. One of the things she says, is, I'm, I'm going to go straight off the bat, if you don't mind, Michael, I've got to tell you this, Shay, this yeah, yeah, story please. of a story of a speaker. So, you know, we like our nested loops and our dense information for you mm. so there was and we're going to talk about presidents i'm going to talk about presidents on the first one we talk about is american president harry truman harry truman was not a great looker was not a very charismatic person in fact he was bullied at school and was not known for speaking up he was a quiet shy reserved guy so if you'd have known him at school you would never have thought this guy this accountant type person is going to become a president of the United States. Well, it's because a long story short, he did become president of the United States, but he was not the favorite 
in the actual election campaign. In fact, he was far from the favourite because he was terrified of crowds and he performed very badly in front of groups. His secret weapon was, though, he was tremendous one-to-one. He was enormously enrolling, engaging. And if you had a conversation with Harry Truman one-to-one, he gave you his full attention. You felt you were the most important person in the world. His campaign team wanted to figure out how to use that to help him succeed. Because he wasn't good on the hustings. Hustings is a word, a British word. I don't know what the American one is uh, <laughs> on the campaign trail. That's but, better, you know, yeah. Yeah, so um, he wasn't very good. In fact, he was poor. So what did they do? Well, at the first campaign debate, it wasn't quite a debate in the form they of... They call the them rallies, campaign. don't they? Rallies. Rallies. Yeah. rallies. First rally where multiple candidates were present and had to speak, Truman attended all his opponents' speeches because they, they didn't do them all. In modern day, they can do them all at once because it's televised. But back in the day, they each uh, candidate would have their own session. Yeah. And so he attended all the other candidates' rallies, but not in the official VIP sections for the candidates. Him himself and his wife got hot dogs or Chris or whatever and sat in the audience with the people viewing it. So that was the first thing he did. He made himself a man of the people. Obviously, they knew he was in the audience because he was a presidential candidate, so he needed to have people around him, but he was always in the audience. While he was in the audience, he would talk to people. He would just talk to them. The other thing he'd done before that was He'd gone around on the trail speaking to individual people, the first baby kisser, if you don't know what that term is, oh, where gosh. Candidates, candidates, you know, that always get a baby and yeah. touch the crowd. So he kind of launched that. So, he, And it was very hard work because if you imagine the candidates would turn up for an hour for their stuff, but he'd be there all day mingling with people and talking to them. Mm-hmm. Then when he arrived to deliver his speech, his speech was incredibly short. He just said, hi, I'm Harry Truman. I stand for this, this, and this. And I've been talking to Mary from there and Jim from here. And, and he was talking about the people in the audience, the ordinary people. He knew their names. He knew who they were. Uh-huh. It was phenomenal. So this very short speech had three incredible ingredients. One was it was short. And I've, I've written down somewhere that says, how ma- however bad a speech is or however bad a story is, if it's short, it at least has one redeeming quality. Yes. It's it's short. (laughs) So that's the first thing. The second thing was he had a, it's called seven plus or minus two. The human brain in any one session, which is a session is normally about 45 minutes, a lot of military commanders and a lot of research has been done to show this. You know, you can maintain concentration in a particular situation or status for 45 minutes hollywood has actually broken this because hollywood has managed to get people sitting still for up to three hours mm. but it's a lot of technology a lot of techniques but for the average person who's on a hollywood budget about 45 minutes is the is the the captivate space where you can hold an audience captive yes in that you've got five plus or minus seven plus or minus two which is three very short points that's Five, oh, yeah, five plus or minus two. That's five minus two is three. Five medium points or seven very small points. So Truman just had three big issues that he shared to the audience. That means when he left the stage, they remembered what he said. Yes. Other candidates were rambling on. And in those days, you could ramble on. There was no real rules. So it, 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 was, it was short. They remembered the points he made. And then the master one for storytellers and speakers, he engaged the audience personally and directly using their names, using anecdotes from the audience. I shared a hot dog with Bill because we both like hot dogs with mustard. My wife doesn't like mustard, but he did, and we had a laugh about that. That little mm-hmm. anecdote connected him to the audience and all the other people. So, yes, that's Harry Truman, and I love that story. And That's one of the stories from the book Captivate, and there's an audiobook version of that as well. So I, I want to share that. So what's been going on with you, Michael? 
Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I love that story. And I, I do just just to to mention in what you've just said, just to briefly follow up on that is, yeah, Barry Mapp, the mind mapping expert, talks about being able to hold information in short term memory. And he talks exactly about that five plus or minus two um, situation when you create mind maps even as well, because you're not going to be able to hold a mind map that has got 20 branches on it in your brain, <laughs> you know, but if you have five plus or minus two, you can, you can cope with that. The other thing is if he started this trend with these three things, if you notice politicians these days, particularly in the UK, often start their response by saying, I've just got three things to mention about that. One, two, three. And that might might have come from that. They've been like trained to only mention three key things in response to something. Um, so yeah, I love that. Fascinating. Wow. I, di I didn't know that. That's, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I'll be looking out for that. Yeah. Look out for that. You'll, you'll hear it now. So, so my, um, short story is about a new documentary that's come out called Rocket Man. And I'll keep it short, but essentially, um, Rocket Man is not about Elton John, is not about uh, um, North Korea. Kim um, Il Young, Kim yeah, Jong Il. Kim Jong Un. <laughs> yeah, it's not about him either. Uh, it's actually about a guy called Michael Hughes, or his nickname is Mad Mike Hughes. He's out to prove that the earth is flat, right? Oh, and wow. they they made this documentary. And actually, when the story broke last year, um, when I was in the middle of doing a weekly cartoon animation with my illustrator, um, somebody, uh, a good friend of both of ours, um, Keith Higgs, when I was mentioning to him what I was doing, he said, oh, I've seen a really great article about this guy who's going to build his own rocket, go into space to prove that the Earth is flat. So <laughs> I did a, I thought it was a great story, read up about it, and I created the cartoon. Then about six months later or so after that, the story died down. It didn't, you know, I didn't hear any more. Though I followed him on YouTube and... Uh, I got contacted by the producer, di producer, not the director, I don't think, the producer of the documentary called Rocket Man. I didn't know it was called Rocket Man, but he contacted me and said, I've seen your animation on YouTube. Would oh you mind if we used it in the credits of the, mo of the documentary? Oh, wow. I went, no, go for it. And a really lovely guy, and he kept in touch with me, and he told me when they shot the movie, the documentary, he was then showing it last year uh, during the summer months in the, all the film festivals, telling me how he was getting on. I mean, he's such a great guy, uh, Toby Brousseau, his name is. And literally in the last week, he sent me the link to Amazon Prime, where this documentary has now come out on Amazon Prime. It's going to come out on YouTube and other channels as well. So I, I don't have Amazon Prime, but luckily... Uh, my wife Claire got a like a one week trial or something, and so I managed to watch it. And right at the end of the movie, I thought it'd be in the credits. He said, "Oh, we're going to include it in the credits." But right at the end, he plays the animation, my our animation, <laughs> and and puts me in the credits as well of the documentary. So I I then spoke to him. I said, "Oh, I would love to get the trailer because I'd seen the trailer last year of the documentary." and then stick the animation at the end of it with the, it's got a really good kind of punk rocky music over my animation, which makes it come alive. And so last night, he literally did that for me. He created the trailer and put the animation at the end, put the music over the top. Really lovely guy. Um, I haven't earned any money from it, but <laughs> I, I'm just so delighted that, that, you know, it happened. Um, so that's my little story of what's been going on in the last few weeks. <laughs> what a great, great story. And if I can say, there's a there's a, another story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which is about um, Gary Player, 
who was a golfer and the first million pound golfer, I believe. Google that and check up. Probably, but, the, yeah. but but he was one of the first people that was was accredited with the saying, "I'm going to attach to you." And what it is, he was obviously a great Gary player, great golfer, and some and and the um, reporter said to him, "You must be the luckiest golfer in the world because in your professional career you've hit, and I don't know if it's the right number, but you've hit five hole in ones." Holes in one, hole in mm-hmm. ones. Not mm-hmm. sure which way that goes. Mm-hmm. And Gary Player said to him, and the, this has been said many times since, but apparently he was the first one that made it famous. He said, you're right. I am so lucky to have hit five hole in ones on the professional circuit. And it's amazing that the more I practice, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would ask that to you because listeners, whoever's in the podcast, one thing about Michael the Groot is the hot is that he works very hard, he's incredibly professional, and he delivers and he delivers and he delivers. And what happens when you do deliver quality stuff, sometimes you can be disheartened because it's not working, but if you stay the course Things like this happen. People say, wow, what a lucky break. You're so lucky, Michael. Mm. It's not luck. No. It's a testament to your professionalism and your stickability and your turning up and you're doing it, doing it, doing it. So I'm sure the the rewards that you want are coming. And this is just a sign. Just keep doing what you're doing, my friend. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll yeah. take that. Yeah. And any, anything else going on with them? I mean, that's pretty that's got me blown away. And I'm gonna I have got Amazon Prime. So I'm going to go and look at Rocky Man, and I'm not going to. I'm going to fast forward to the end. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, in all seriousness, don't fast forward to the end. I didn't believe it or not. I didn't. I watched the whole documentary. It's only an hour and a half. It's such a wonderful documentary. It's such a great storytelling, and you really warm to the guy. I, although, obviously, I don't agree with his thought process that the Earth is flat. But nevertheless, it's just an amazing story and I really warm to the guy. And there is a message in there. I won't say what the message is. Everybody will get their own message. There is a message talking about hard work. There is a message in there. Fantastic. And talking about hard work, can I segue to my next what's been happening story for Yeah, me? go for it. Yeah. Well... And it's, I suppose, it's almost the opposite of hard work. I don't know how to put this. So I, I've just been being very successful, having said that, that's, obviously, I've worked hard in the past. So lots of success been coming my way. But success carries with, okay, quote from Napoleon Hill, every disaster has within it the seeds of an equivalent or greater benefit if you're willing to seek and search for that benefit. Mm-hmm. So basically, every every cloud has a silver lining. But there's also a Zen, a Buddhist, uh, New Age thinking idea that yin and yang, good and bad, go hand in hand. So everything carries its own reverse. You know, we've all got a doppelganger. We've all, everything has an opposite, up and down, left and right, good, male, female. So that saying, as wonderful and motivational as it is, it also hints at that within every success <laughs> mm-hmm. lies the seeds of an equivalent or greater disaster. Right. If you're, if you're not careful and you're not watching to make sure it doesn't grab you. Right, right. So that's why we're often most at risk when we're most successful. We take our eye off the ball. Mm -hmm. We become complacent. We relax. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I found myself in this particular point in time because stuff is coming at me and I, I don't feel I have the capacity to deal with it, but I also feel compelled to take it all on. Just sharing with the, the listeners, my story is I'm being reminded that the most powerful word that makes really successful people successful is not yes, it's Mm -hmm. no. (laughs) (laughs) It's our ability to say no. 
And I just haven't been saying no often enough. Mm. And this this uh, idea of yin and yang and twisting leads me to my the person I've been studying almost addicted to for the last two and a half years. And that time scale should give you the clue. Donald Trump. <laughs> and this is nested. There's about three pieces in this. So please do pay attention. Donald Trump. His name came up in the book Captivate by Vanessa Van. Edwards. Edwards. <laughs> and I was talking about now what she she actually did a, does a lot of research. She's she calls herself a um a people researcher, not a people watcher, but a people researcher. She doesn't watch people. She takes the numbers and calculates and manipulates them and finds the information that's intangible and normally hidden. And she likes to do detailed analysis of people who speak and how they speak and how they come across. And she compared a number of famous presidents to see who was the most effective in using hand gestures to communicate mm -hmm. and the effect of their hand gestures in their performance. And she had Kennedy, obviously, ask not what your country can do for you, ask for, you know, the famous Kennedy. Yeah. Um, she had Bill Clinton, who was known as the great communicator, as well as Ronald Reagan and... And I'm going to say Donald Trump. I think there was some others, but those are the four key ones. Wow. Not Barack and, Obama. And, but thank you very much. And Barack Obama. Oh, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. Barack. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. Well, so she had these five presidents. And, they, and then she asked her audiences, which one do you think is the most effective in communicating and using hand gestures? Mm -hmm. And vote on that. The other question you asked was, who uses the most hand gestures? I know uh, what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is Donald Trump. Yeah, his hands have become famous for sure. Yeah. yeah. He uses the mo he, and he and he uses it in a as analog markers to underline what he's saying. Mm. The other piece of research she did, which is very important, is that she analyzed 450 plus TEDx talks. That's ridiculous. That, <laughs> it took her researcher six months, and they analyzed all the key indicators and assets of TED Talk speakers. And they wanted to know in 18 minutes – how many times they look left, how many times they look right, how many times they look up, look down, side, breathe in, breathe out, move their hands, walk around, all this stuff, analyzed, analyzed, because they wanted to know what was the key thing that was common to the most successful TEDx videos, ones that went viral and did millions and millions of views in the shortest amount of time. And the common fact was hand gestures. <laughs> All things being the same, the speaker with the more and more congruent hand gestures could be as much as 12 and a half times more successful, regardless of topic. Regardless of topic. That's, that's pretty massive. Yeah. And the evidence is Donald Trump. You have the eloquent Barack Obama, who those of us who class ourselves as intellectuals, as students of the art of speaking and storytelling, we know that Barack's are great. We know that Clinton's great. And Kennedy, wow, he's come down through time. But Trump, just um, segueing back to our three rules, he breaks one of the rules massively, and that's time. He, he goes on and on and on, and he, people think, say he's rambling. But within his ramblings, and this is proven by analysis, he repeats his key messages over and over. In one sentence, Donald Trump will say the same thing at three times minimum. Mm -hmm. in a, and in one sentence, he'll say like, well, <clears throat> you know, 
this, these people, they say, what is it? We're going to win. We're going to keep on winning. We're going to win so big you're going to get fed up of winning. <laughs> it, it, that's in one sentence. He's anchored win, 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 winning. And he does that. Open, when, he's, when he's being interviewed by reporters, he'll say, well, I think that I was treated very unfairly. Of all the people that have been treated unfairly, I'm possibly the person who's been treated the most unfairly for the longest it's just so unfair that I'm unfairly I'm being treated. Yeah, yeah. So even though he's going on for a long time, he ain't saying very much, which I think we'll all agree with. Yeah. But it's it's interesting because I've also watched um, the documentary by Michael Moore, Eleven Nine, which is on Netflix now. Yeah. Um, you know, Fahrenheit 11.9, mm -hmm. which reversed from Fahrenheit 9.11, where he talks and goes round people talking about Trump and other things as well, Flint and America and all sorts, poisoning of Flint. Yeah, the water, yeah. Yeah, the water poisoning there. Uh, great storyteller, Michael Moore, amazing. Um, and... And... And you're right, he, he does, you know, Trump does repeat a lot of things. The other thing he's really, really good at is using metonymies in his language. And which remind, are, yeah, remind yeah. us what a metonymy well, is. Well, a really simple way to say is a metonymy is a more complicated version of a metaphor. A metaphor you can, you know, is as heavy as a brick. So you know what you're talking about, but a metonymy is not as easy, which means the brain has to work to make the connection. For example, we're going to drain the swamp, right? Uh, which he got everybody chanting or lock her up. Um, that one, not so much, but drain the swamp, right? What does it actually mean? It means, it means nothing and it means a huge amount because everybody now has a visual picture of a swamp at, and draining it, right? But he keeps repeating it. He gets people chanting these words. It becomes yeah, memorable, yeah, yeah. and he just repeats it seven times over in one sentence, and people now, all they want to do is drain the swamp, you know, get rid of the established yeah. elite yeah, in yeah. politics, because here's a businessman who knows what he's talking about. I, I would... Not necessarily agree with that, no. but but that's the whole point. You know, yeah. he's convinced them through his language and using metonymies because then people will remember it for longer because their their brain has had to work to work out what he's actually talking about. And you beautifully correct. You see, you've, you've saved some time on this podcast because that's not as eloquently as you've done it, Michael. But that's what I was talking about with these techniques of repetition and forcing the metaphor effort mm. so you you're wrong lock her up is just as powerful as drain the strump okay for, to lock her up they have to get the picture of she's guilty why would you lock her up if she's not guilty yes yeah you're right you're right so she's yeah. guilty and then the, the, and just by saying lock her up the brain has to put all the pieces in because what does the brain like to do why does it like stories it's got to create meaning mm. And truth and fiction don't, don't matter to the brain. So to chant, lock her up, lock her up, the brain has to do all, trigger all of the synapses and wiring that make that make sense to give it meaning. And the most recent one he's done using the same technique, which appears so short, so simple, but he's forced the brain to work so hard to create cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and I'll talk about it more. Is, is the one about to kick her out. Send her back. Was it send her back? The last one he did. Yeah, yeah. Send Which them back. Send, send them back. Send them back. Yeah. yeah. So allegedly that he, that he that's been written, that's been crafted, that's been engineered. People have been paid to make that happen because of the metonymy. Metonymy. What's that word? Metronome? Yeah, metonymy. Metonymy. <laughs> I know. It's because, it's because of the metonomic effect, where if the brain has to work to create the meaning, do you want to go deep on this? No. 
Okay, I won't go into detail. I won't tell you <laughs> no, about do Ollie. that next time. But okay, Ollie could then decide it's in myelin sheathing. But yeah, so lock her up. Lock her up is you. You're, so you're right. I'm just agreeing with you. That what you're saying is right. This metonymy is um, locking her up. Yeah. So that was so that's Donald Trump and his hand movements and his incredible storytelling mm. and his way of protecting himself by just not saying much, even though he's speaking a long time. Yeah, a brilliant politician skill. Yeah, I hate to agree with that. <laughs> well, he's president of the United States, and he's and he's still there, even though allegedly he wants to. But not allegedly, he wants. Again, sorry to go on about Trump, but he he just he's such a great speaker, and I argue with people who think he's a rubbish speaker. He's a great communicator, and even this his distraction is a, is a magician. What is a magician's greatest tool? Misdirection, yes. distraction. Yeah. Make them look here when the action's over here. Ninety percent of what he does to look the buffoon is distracting from massive. You know, he's reforming America at a fundamental level. He's filling the super. Anyway, I'm going to apologize. It, but the, mm. for the speak, the speaking bit I wanted to mention was that he is able to say one thing to stop you thinking about the other thing. Yes. Which comedians do it, all great communicators do it. So now he wants to buy Denmark. <laughs> no, it's know. Greenland. It's Greenland. Greenland. <laughs> yeah, that, that is such a misdirection. And he doubles down on it by making getting the Danish prime minister to get involved in it. And she clearly doesn't want to, but she has to respond because it's so absurd. Then when she says it's absurd, he goes, wow, you've offended me by making it absurd. So this is all important when you're communicating, when you're giving speeches, when you're telling stories. Because if you can build the audience to go one way, and then in one word, you just go, Choo. but actually, this is what was going on. It makes your speech in riveting. It makes your stories anchored. That's why, you know, Little Red Riding Hood and go through all the stories. The, the fairy tales always got a little twist in them. The great, you know, um, Agatha Christie, she was m incredibly good at leading the reader or the film goer down a particular path, making it really congruent. Yeah, this is where we go and this is what they look like. And then all of a sudden, the butler did it. Wow, the butler! Never saw that coming! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So that, that. So that's about. What else? What else is going on uh, in the world of telling and speeches for for us? Well, um, I, actually, I've got a tip for people, and that, and this is this is not a, this is this is a practical storytelling hack, <clears throat> and it relates to something. Totally unrelated. It's called a hashtag, right? Okay. And you know, hashtags started pretty much first on Twitter. And then they've migrated in every single platform pretty much. But the latecomers is a platform called LinkedIn. And if people aren't on LinkedIn, that's fine. But if you are, <laughs> if you are, and you'd like to use it better, and you are sharing stuff on there, that you'd like to be able to categorize together, then use a hashtag. Uh, it needs to be one that is pretty much your own. So for example, example, my company's called Staying Alive UK. So my hashtag is hashtag Staying Alive UK. And it's become my own because nobody uses that hashtag. So when I add on a post or a comment, my hashtag, pretty much with the post, I don't think comments work, but with the post that I put there, the hashtag follows with that. And you can then search on the hashtag and get all the information. It's a great wow, way. So, so, okay, slow down, slow down mm. now, because you, you, you've down, because Michael is also, um, this is, this is um, <laughs> I love Michael podcast, but <laughs> Michael is, is the LinkedIn expert and he just pours some stuff out there. So a key thing was the hashtag is literally a hash is literally the the hash sign in front of a word 
And on LinkedIn, when you put the hashtag up, it actually suggests hashtags as well, doesn't it? Yes. So, and and I was wondering, so what? So what? I've so always So create your own. So yeah, so create your own. So let's say we have a hashtag. No, let, let me finish. So I was actually, okay, okay. So, just so people can follow, because you're deep in this. So, because what you're saying, the important thing is, and I just want to reiterate this, because I didn't get it for literally years. I was putting the hashtags on because you told me to, but I didn't, know why, I didn't know why. But then one day it clicked. It wasn't for other people necessarily, although it is. So if you want to know about speaking, if you search on hashtag speaking, you get you, you pull all that stuff up. And just again, to emphasize what Michael's just said, if you have your own unique hashtag, you can now, this this um, this revolutionized things for me because I didn't realize I could go back. If I'd done, if I'd understood what you said a few years ago and had a unique hashtag, I could go back and find all my posts. Yes. That's, that is, but sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to make sure that our listeners understand how important the uniqueness is and how powerful what they can do is. Mm. So, so, so carry on. And how can you, can you search hashtags by date, Michael? They, they they sort themselves in date order. Oh, I didn't know that. So, for example, if you put in hashtag story of a speech, which is our podcast, um, there are several posts there and they go, one was about a month ago, then three months ago, then, oh no, two months ago, three months ago, etc. And it shows you everything that was posted that had that hashtag on it and because nobody uses story of a speech because it's our unique title for this podcast that not many people use that's why it's good to find a unique title i mean you could even use your own name if it's really unique so unlikely there would be hashtag Mike, michael don for, ex for example michael michael smith would be pretty unique wouldn't it no <laughs> no <laughs> But find one that's unique that no one is using. And that means only your content goes with that. And you're absolutely right. You then have all of the content because you lose it. Otherwise, you'll never be able to retrieve stuff that you've put out there. And it also means you can then share that link, um, you know, because the, the URL will be linkedin.com slash feed slash hashtag slash story of a speech. Wow, you have to put that. You've got to put that in the, the, in the notes. notes. I'll put this. it in the yeah, notes. Please, yeah. that, that's brilliant. So I only mention it off the top of my head because I went, oh, I want to share this more with people. So I've done it verbally on audio, but I will probably do a little article about it too. The, the, it's good to, to, let's say, collect your stories together. So if you are publishing little stories if you use the hashtag with it once you post it on LinkedIn, then you can collect all your stories together in one location. Brilliant. Hey, you know what? People might listen to this podcast and think we've planned this so well because it's so seamless because I'm going to come to the end of my sort of bit here mm. to talk about Vanessa Van Andrews and how she Edwards. says... <laughs> Vanessa Van Edwards. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Vanessa. I do love you. Um, she says you should collect your stories. You should have your stories. It's very important. She has a whole chapter on your story file, your storybook. I forget the name she has. She has a special name for it. Because basically, when you're in conversations, she gives all the stories, categories mm. associated with personality types mm. and with where you are. And so you can be telling you could be in a conversation or giving a speech and because you know, okay, this is the point in the speech where I want to make them raise their energy. This is the point of the speech where I want to make them feel more serious. It's, this is my interpretation because I, I do things called levity, brevity, and gravity with some old speaking stuff. There are three types of speech, levity for laughter, brevity, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So what Michael just said there, having this list of hashtags for your stories then means that you, you, you don't have to memorize them because you can go into hashtag and have a look down your stories and then say, oh, I'm speaking here next week. This is one of my stories. We, we all, I struggle anyway to remember all the stories I know. Yes. So, and if you've got a phone, 
and you've got LinkedIn or Twitter and you post stories regularly as we do, I now know how to, because I've got my hashtag Don's stories or hashtag Don's um, chat points. I can now say, that's brilliant, Michael. And that's what Captivate tells us to do as speakers, as storytellers, as communicators. Don't leave your content to chance. Yeah. Yeah. Have them ready. So that's kind of, so I think that's been a, a good. So that, that's kind of the last thing that I've got to say yes. for this section, just so that storytelling, giving speeches is the number one money making skill that you have. Mm-hmm. And it's been that way since the dawn of time. And I think it's going to be that way for a lot longer. It's growing as well. It's growing now. I think people are starting to realize that it's a skill that people need to need to own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that's that's me for this this session. Short and sweet. Just wanted to have a little break from the the speech of others, and we'll be back soon with V for Vendetta, an analysis. A little bit different from the others we've done, but I think you'll find it educational and entertaining. Brilliant. So it's goodbye from Michael. And it's goodbye from Michael. Goodbye. Goodbye indeed. <laughs> <laughs>